This is Stefan Kinsella, a libertarian patent attorney in Houston, Texas, and you're listening to the Prometheus Unbound podcast. You're listening to the Prometheus Unbound podcast, episode one, interview with Stefan Kinsella. This podcast is the audio counterpart of the Prometheus Unbound webzine, a libertarian review of speculative fiction and literature featuring news, reviews, and more. And we are your hosts, Jeffrey Allen Ploche and Matthew Alexander. We're libertarians talking about speculative fiction. I'm the editor of Prometheus Unbound, an independent scholar and political philosopher, and a freelance writer, editor, educator, and web designer. And I'm the primal leading, Spanish speaking, soccer watching, heterodox author of libertarian science fiction novel, Wither We. So, Jeffrey, what, uh, what's been on your agenda recently? What have you been reading? Well, I haven't had a lot of time for reading lately. I've been working on the website and planning the podcast and everything, but I did manage to finish reading uh, Cameron Hurley's book called God's War. Uh, I think the third book in that trilogy just came out recently, but I've only read the first uh, novel so far. It was interesting. Um, very uh, fantasy? It's kind of both science fiction and fantasy in a way. It's, it's kind of those science fantasies where the magic is kind of explained by science. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's an interesting book, uh, some interesting world building. It's, uh, it's set some, I guess, some unspecified time in the future, uh, definitely thousands of years on a different planet. And it's uh, Muslim cultures, uh, some different you know, countries at war with each other and holy wars, uh, and the entire economy and so-called, I guess, technology and magic systems are based on genetic engineering and bugs. Hmm. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> okay. It's weird. There's cars. They call them bakis or something, and they're powered by bugs. Yeah. <laughs> and there's yeah. uh, the magicians all control bugs. Like that's one of the things that's kind of I'm not sure about with the with the, with the book is because I'm wondering if human beings actually learn to coexist with bugs so readily. Because there's talking bugs about everywhere. regular sized bugs or big bugs or what? Regular and giant big bugs. Like, with, oh, but okay. mainly there's like you know, there's bugs in every every building. Some people are just crawling with bugs, especially the magicians. Uh, and it's just it's they're so prevalent that it's. I don't know, I'd be grossed out by it, but maybe people, maybe people get used to it. I don't know. Uh, so that's one of the, one of the issues. All this very interesting and imaginative, though. Libertarians might not like the book because uh, the main character the protagonist is, uh, I think we consider her to be very evil. She's uh, a, a government assassin and, and, and a mercenary who uh, one of her main jobs has been to go and pick up boys who've deserted from the front, uh, you know, the front lines of the war. And you bring them back or kill them. Oh, interesting. So, yeah, she's done a lot of bad stuff in her past. You don't have to like protagonists to enjoy this story. True, true. And she may be reforming, so that's one good aspect of it. And there are some other good side characters that are more uh, more appealing to us. Another issue ahead of this book is, despite the imaginative world building, there were some anachronisms that threw me out of the story on occasion. This is thousands of years in the future in a Muslim country on a foreign planet, and yet we still have uh, sodas and, and bottles, vodka. Yeah. Uh, whiskey, you know, things like that. So it's, you know, things those kind of things. Like, yeah, you know, are those really still existing? I mean, <laughs> yeah. And sometimes the pedals in the car are referred to as gas pedals, even the cars are powered by bug juice or whatever. Yeah. So it's it's little ac- anachronisms like that kind of threw me out of the story sometimes. But it was an interesting story, interesting world building, and I've never seen an economy and magic system you know, based on genetic engineering and bugs like that before. So. <laughs> so are yeah. the bugs magical, or what do they do? Well, there's some kind of weird, like the magicians have some kind of weird, like mental connection with them so they can control them and stuff. Oh, okay. And they can do a little bit of healing and other things, you know, but they can use some bugs to communicate or spy on people and control them for defense and attacking people and things like that. And then there's also these gene pirates and gene, uh, genetic manipulators who they have the technology to like, you know, repair limbs and that kind of thing. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting. Okay. Is there a review forthcoming? Uh, yeah, I need to uh, get that one written up soon. It probably won't be out before the uh, episode airs, though, so yeah. we'll see. Uh, so what have you been up to? Uh, Reading-wise, not as much recently. I've been doing a lot of writing. I, the last novel I read was uh, by John Ringo. And, uh, oh, for crying out loud, I forgot, uh, forgot the name of it. Can't think of the name of the novel. But uh, it, it's kind of an interesting premise. A uh, gate shows up in the solar system, and we get our first introduction. We humans get our first introduction to an alien species. Uh, The first to come through are just kind of neutral traders. They won't bother you. You don't bother them, that type of thing. The next group that comes through, though, is bent on imperialist domination. 
so there is the earth comes under the dominion of this other species. Uh, the main character in the book uh, discovers that maple syrup is uh, highly addictive to a certain alien species out there in the galaxy. And he winds up practically cornering the market on maple syrup and uh, gets super rich selling that across the galaxy. Hmm. And he uses his wealth to build a resistance uh, to the species dominating the earth. I can't believe I can't remember what the name of the book is. But uh, it, it started out very interesting. I, I thought it was uh, an interesting premise. I was engaged following along, but it didn't really give you any great characters. It didn't delve into anything a whole lot. It, it was a lot of like highlights, mm. uh, like uh, you would you would touch down with the characters for a moment as they discuss some big project they were going to do, and then it would fast forward through a few things, and then you'd go to another meeting where they'd talk about another project they're going to do, and there wasn't anything really in the story to to keep my attention. It, it felt like it was really glossing over a lot of things and went over a lot of ground and sounds very plot focused. Is it an older book? No, it's not, it's not that old, uh, a mm. few years old. Okay. Most. Well, it's I a, think John, it's a trilogy. I think John, Ringo, it's the, yeah. I think John Ringo is an older writer though. So he's probably got an old, you know, older writing style. Well, I, it didn't strike me as an older writing style. It, honestly, it struck me almost like an outline for a for a, a bigger novel okay. just hitting kind of the the main points and you, you never really get in with the characters and in any interesting scenes of tension or whatever it, it's just going through the major plot points as they have meetings discussing right. what they're going to be doing uh no real memorable characters the reason i i picked it up is because there was a in one of the reviews of my book, someone had compared an aspect of my book to John Ringo style writing. So I was kind of curious to read hmm. that. OK, I guess you will have a review up for it before long, huh? Yeah, actually, that'll be my next one. So live free or die. That's the name uh, that one. I've heard so about that bad one with names. Yeah. Live free didn't or that, die. Didn't that win the Prometheus Award or something? Uh, it may have. Uh, it. I wouldn't call it libertarian. That doesn't mean it's not going to get uh, win the award, though. No, no, you're right about that. As we as we found out this year, you don't have to be uh, very libertarian to win the Prometheus Award for best libertarian you, novel. No, you don't have to be libertarian. Full stop. Yeah. <laughs> omit the word very. I, mean, I, I think they're desperate for yeah for different entries. But yeah, sometimes you, in they fact, reach even a bit. Uh, the one book we read, uh, McLeod even expressed surprise on his own blog that his book had been nominated for a Prometheus Award. He said, I don't yeah. know what they're doing, but... <laughs> well, that's not the first time, I'm sure. We can have a link to that on the show notes, uh, yeah. and, as well as the one to mine. I just remembered another criticism I had for the Cameron Hurley book, and it's not a major one, but you know, the, the main character, her name is Nix. Uh, she's supposed to be this badass assassin uh, you know, character, but yeah. uh, from, for like maybe two-thirds, three-fourths of the book, you don't really get to see much of that. She almost seems incompetent. Maybe it's because her opponents are so badass themselves mm -hmm. that she's having a hard time you know, you know, dealing with them with her motley crew of mercenaries. But you don't really get to see how badass she is until towards the end of the book. Uh, and you know, it could be done on purpose to show that despite how badass she is, you know, she's not the only badass in the world. And, and she's you know, facing better funded you know, uh, uh, opponents with greater number who know more about mm -hmm. what's going on than she does. But it it seems like almost too much, you know, telling and enough showing. So I'm not sure which of the, you know, which which yeah. is the case here. Well, but, to start uh, the book out, yeah. certainly it'd be a good idea to mm -hmm. show her at the height of her powers, and then right. maybe have her run into something that causes her some problems. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Have a scene somewhere early in the book to show how how badass she is. So in context, you understand that when she's struggling later on, it's because her opponents are badass too. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. yep. Well, I think we've probably gone on long enough. Let's long get to the main Stephen. course. Indeed. So. We've got a long interview with Stefan Kinsella for you. It's a little over 50 minutes long. Stefan is a patent attorney and a libertarian legal scholar, best known for his opposition to intellectual property. We asked him on the show to discuss his love of science fiction and fantasy and the problem of intellectual property and piracy in the digital age. And now, on to the interview. Stefan, thanks for joining us on the podcast. Glad to be here. I know you're a fan of science fiction and fantasy. I think I've also heard that you've read comics as a kid. Do you still read comics? 
Well, yeah, yeah I've gone through phases in my uh, my life where I read them for three or four years, five years, and I stop and I pick them up again. And since I've had a kid, I have a nine year old now, so uh, he's into Marvel comics now. So I'm I'm rereading them again with him, but he's passed me up. So he's uh, he knows <laughs> things about the Marvel universe and DC universe that I don't even understand right now. Yeah, <laughs> maybe you can tell uh, our listeners what your favorite uh, works of uh, genre fiction are science fiction fantasy that sort of thing you know i have always just loved uh science fiction and fantasy um pretty much science fiction is my favorite uh among these groups among fantasy i mean i could pick out the ones i've really liked which is like uh marion zimmer bradley miss of avalon uh stephen r donaldson and uh you know of course tolkien those kinds of things mm -hmm. but science fiction has really been the thing i've really loved and so uh, I don't know about the genres among those, but th there's just too many to list. But, you know, of course, the main science fiction guys, uh, Werner Vinja, I guess that's how you pronounce his last name. I've never actually been quite sure how you pronounce his last name. I've heard yeah, it so many different ways, like Mises, Mises, whatever. But uh, Werner mm -hmm. Vinja, Vinja, whatever. Also, the, uh, the Hyperion guy, Dan Simmons, Hyperion books. I love those books. I love some Orson Scott Card. So those are some of the ones I've really enjoyed. Matthew has a view of Hyperion, right? You love that book. Oh, I, I liked it quite a bit. Yeah, I read it for the first time just a few months ago, or maybe it was last year. I, I loved it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, of course, uh, Heinlein, his, uh, The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, and also To Sail Beyond the Sunset, and uh, you know, Star Trek Troopers, and Time Enough for Love are some of my favorite books by him. Yeah, Heinlein is popular among libertarians. Yeah, although I've, I've wondered in you know recent years whether he really is that libertarian. I'm not really sure where he's mm -hmm. coming from. He seems to experiment in his different books with different themes. Uh, you know, Starship Troopers is not as libertarian in my estimation now as I used to think it was. It was kind of no, not at all. Oh yeah, it's a lot <laughs> militaristic, fascist. And, yeah, it's yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, more fascist and. I mean, mm -hmm. he has some cool ideas about you, you can only vote if you've served in the military, that kind of stuff. So he's sort of limiting the right to democracy. And I like that aspect of it. But the idea that you get to vote because you've served in the military is not really the best. Idea. That's probably going to shock some of our listeners that you actually don't like democracy. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yeah, that's, a, that's a whole can of worms we don't want to open right now. Uh, yep. Okay. Uh, no, what about can... in film? What, yeah, what type film. of science fiction fantasy have you liked in film? Well, I remember I was, uh, I don't know, a young kid. When I saw Star Wars in 76, you know, I was 11 years old. And I, I of course, love that. And Star Trek, I've always been a Trekker, you know, Star Wars and, um, you know, just the, the classics, the classic, uh, the classic sci-fi movies. Uh, really, one of my favorite movies of all time is probably Groundhog Day, which is not that science fiction, but it's, still, <laughs> you know, a little bit. So it's just more yeah. fantasy. Huh? Yeah, more fantasy. You mentioned you saw The Hobbit recently. Did you like that? You know, I didn't like it. I didn't dislike it, but it was too long, and I just think it, it just tried too hard to get the magic of the original trilogy of movies, which, which were fantastic, I thought. Something about it just didn't click with me. It was just the technology of it. It was the, I saw the, on the fast frame rate, and it had that soap opera effect, which made it seem yeah. kind of, yeah, it was more clear. But And the, the 3D, I thought, was unnecessary. It was distracting, so it just... I give it like, you know, 2.5 or something, unfortunately. It's lower yeah. than Matthew gave it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually saw that. Um, I saw it over the weekend. I meant to put a comment on the website. Uh, and I'll probably do that soon. Um, I think I, I agree with a lot of the criticisms that people have had about it. A lot of I might have enjoyed it more as just, a, you know, if you're eye candy. Yeah. You know, I just enjoyed watching it. But Did you it see it been 48 better. or 24? I think I saw it 24. And yeah. uh, I didn't see it. It didn't look all like ca cartoony to me. So I think I saw 24 frame rate. I uh, read one reviewer. He said you can see the contact lenses in uh, Gandalf's eyes. Oh, really? Forty-eight frame rate. I definitely did not see the twenty-eight. Um, yeah. But one thing that I kind of wish you'd covered in your review, I hadn't read the book in a long time, so it struck me when I saw the movie, is how much of a unlibertarian jerk Gandalf is in the beginning oh. of the movie. <laughs> you know, he, he vandalizes Bilbo's door and, yeah. and, uh, and trespasses on his house, and basically has a party against his wishes in his house, and drags him on a dangerous journey, yeah. you know, all against his will. <laughs> it's almost an unlibertarian angle to the That's story. That's true. Although, you know, the last time I read the book, I wasn't yet a libertarian. So. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. Yeah. So it, it struck me yeah. when I watched the movie again. Yeah. yeah. Did, have you read the book recently? I, so I read the book recently, about a year ago. With, I reread it with my son um, at like at nighttime, you know, um, and my wife just to because they had never read it. 
And uh, mm-hmm. watching the movie, I was thinking, man, there's a lot in this movie that is not in the book, which was, which actually didn't bother me. I, I assumed they grounded it in Tolkien's notes. I think the Radagast stuff was not in the uh, in the book that I recall, and um, uh, of course that that didn't bother me. It's just that you could tell that mm-hmm. they were putting a lot in that wasn't in the original, and I wonder if they're trying to drag it out just for monetary purposes to have a, a trilogy or whatever. But it was just something about the movie just was below the level of the first trilogy of movies in my in, in mm-hmm. my and my wife's estimate. Um, yeah, I think some stuff they got from the appendices and other you know, background material that he wrote. Other other things like Radagast, they almost entirely made up. He you know? he was mentioned in mm-hmm. The Hobbit, but I think that's it. He never makes an appearance mm-hmm. in well, the, the book. Whole, and uh, um, one person who's like a, a Tolkien scholar mentioned that the uh, whole rabbit thing, might, the, the the super rabbit sled, yeah. uh, might have been made up by Guillermo, Guillermo del Toro. But, <laughs> <laughs> Before we move on to um, your forte, intellectual property, could you maybe mention a few of your favorite libertarian works of fiction for our listeners? Yeah, I mean, I used to, um, you know, I've gone through phases in my life where I, um, I look for libertarian fiction sometimes, and sometimes I don't for different reasons. But I think early, early on, of course, I loved uh, like Daniel Shulman's Alongside Night. I loved, of course, Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged. I would say that the Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged, um, which are sort of libertarian sort fiction, of at least Atlas Shrugged. Shrugged. Yeah. Uh, were the catalyst for me getting interested in all this. Uh, in retrospect, I honestly, I think of The Fountainhead as more of a, a tale of IP terrorism. I don't really... <laughs> 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 I mean, it's got some individualism messages, but not really realistic and anchored in the way, the way that the real world works in terms of satisfying your customers. And in terms of politics, I'm just wondering what I really ever saw in The Fountainhead, to be honest. Atlas Shrugged, I loved. I recently reread it for the third or fourth time, and I thought it was much better than I thought I would think it was at this point in time. But of course, there's also um, L. Neil Smith's The Probability Brooch and The Galatin Divergence, which I loved. And you know, when you're sort of a young libertarian, you read these things and you see this whole world portrayed, and you get these ideas of how things could happen, and they just stick in your mind. I mean, all of these ideas in. Uh, the probability brooch and Galatin divergence about the way criminals are dealt with. I remember there's a scene in one of those two by L. Neil Smith where someone is a suspect in a crime and he's caught and he's put in a like a four star hotel for like four or five days until they can figure out what happened. And the reason they put him there instead of putting him in a jail was because in case they're wrong, then the damages would be much less because he's put in, put up in a nice hotel for a while. You know, so there's all these kind of cool ideas in those kinds of books. You know, of course, you know, Ayn Rand's Anthem and some of the works I've read in more recent years, too, like We and others. But it's hard to identify explicitly libertarian fiction now that's not too preachy, etc. But I always look for it. I think that's a major danger for libertarians uh, who attempt to write fiction, especially if they've read Ayn Rand before, as they, they tend to be too preachy almost like Bible thumpers hitting people over the head with with our libertarianism, like long speeches, giving out theory and and all that stuff. Yeah, I think one thing about Rand that I actually have come to appreciate, I really believe her when she explains that her motivation for being a philosopher was just to inform her storytelling. I mean, she just wanted to be an artist. And I think she tried really hard in Atlas Shrugged, for example, to portray a world in an artistic way, right? And the philosophy informed it, but it wasn't about hitting you over the head with philosophy, although she did that, but maybe that was just an artistic uh, misstep. But her attempt was to portray a world. I think I read by Vince Aprinowitz a few years ago a book called, the I want to say, The Black Arrow. The Black Arrow, yeah, which, I read that a few years ago. I don't know what you thought about it, but I honestly, I just, <laughs> it, was, it was just <laughs> horrible, horrible, horrible. I had trouble believing the characters. Uh, yeah, and plus it was very misogynistic, I thought. But I'm reading one, I, I, I'll tell you what, I'm reading one right now by uh, have, do you guys know of Robert James Bidinato? Never heard uh, of him. Yes, I do. He's an objectivist. He's like an old school objectivist. He, mm-hmm. he used to edit the, uh, the magazine of the David Kelly groups, uh, I guess it's called the Atlas Society, called the New, I think the New Individualist or whatever. He's sort of yeah. a, he's doing his own thing now, but he was sort of popular in the, early 80s. He had a lot of these audio tapes. I used to listen to this guy. I've met him. But he is an anti-Ron Paul, anti-anarchist 
kind of guy. And he he was the guy that actually broke the story about um, Willie Horton. Remember the, the guy who was the uh, uh, oh the the the, uh, the kind of a scruffy looking kind of dangerous ex black felon during the George Bush Michael Dukakis campaign. Yeah, I remember him. So he broke that story in Reader's Digest. So that's his sort of cl- one of his claims to fame. And so he's really big yeah. on he's big on crime and punishment. Anyway, he's got a he's got a new novel out. It's called Hunter, and I'll be honest, I'm about one half through it, and it is an impressive work for a first effort. I mean, there's a little bit of that he's telling instead of showing in it, yeah. and you can tell he's kind of criticizing these governors who allow you know who who grant pardons or clemency to prisoners too early. So he's kind of got this objectivist idea that. You know, bad guys should be put behind bars, and I understand where he's coming from, but he doesn't have the anarchist approach to it. But it's it's a good novel. I'm actually enjoying it. I'll be honest; I'm halfway through it, and uh, it's one of the best quasi libertarian books I've read um, in a while. Interesting. Yeah. Is it a you're talking about a short novel or is it a big thing? No, epic? it's it's uh it's on my it's on my uh, iPad, but I, I uh I'd say it's a you know regular length of. Uh, I won't say Tom Clancy because Tom Clancy writes big ones, but uh, yeah. I'd say it's the equivalent of a 300 or 350 page uh, um, novel. But it goes pretty quickly, and he's pretty good. He he could flesh out his characters a little bit more, but it's it's I'm, I'm actually impressed, and uh, I want to see where he goes with it. Well, that that, that cool. kind of makes me want to read it now because I, we have a I republished a podcast uh, from mm-hmm. Jeff, Jeff Rigenbach's uh, Libertarian Tradition podcast. Mm-hmm. It was really it was really published on the Mises Institute uh, website Mises.org a while back. Uh, on Ben Noto's Hunter, um, and I think uh, Rickenbach, if I recall, uh, wasn't quite so enthused about the novel and used it as an opportunity to bash uh, objectivist subculture. Well, I'm only halfway through, so he, I don't know, and I don't remember uh, Rickenbach's um, a review of it. But um, um, apparently, my understanding is uh, Ben Noto, you know, he's he's sort of in his uh, waning years in terms of career, et cetera. I think he's no longer editor of that magazine for atlas society and i think he was looking for a new career so he started writing this novel and i think he self-published it or something like that and he, he had pretty good you know sales on um amazon under the kindle uh imprint uh, create space or whatever it is and he's done pretty well so i think he's got a sequel coming out um it was actually mm-hmm. a, a pretty cool story from an not ip really but really from a, a way you can use modern technology to find an audience uh point of view yeah. And I read a lot of the reviews, and you got to be careful reading the reviews because you don't know who's the guy's friends and who's you know, yeah, being paid. But it, it but um, so far I'm uh, I'm actually um, uh, I'm impressed by it, and um, uh, I mean I don't think I could write something near that good. Um, I, I see fl- some flaws in it, but uh, it's not like an amateur work at all. It's um, it's enjoyable. Hmm. I'll have to check that I'll out. Have to put that on my list. Yeah. Yeah, it's, anyway, uh, it's ten times better than. Um, Black Arrow. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned in the discussion of the Fountainhead, the IP terrorism. I guess a good way to get back to um, you know what you do. You're a patent attorney and one of the leading, if not the leading, libertarian theorists on the issue of intellectual property. Some of our listeners are probably not be libertarians uh, and not know a lot about intellectual property. So uh, could you give us a very, very brief explanation of how intellectual property arose yeah, and, sure. and what, common, what, what the common misconceptions about it are? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I'm a uh, yeah I'm a patent attorney and I'm a, been a libertarian and a patent attorney for about the same amount of time, about twenty twenty five years. And uh, about twenty years ago, I, I started you know thinking hard about this issue and realized there was something really wrong with the idea or with the with the arguments being given at the time for this idea of patent and copyright, which are called intellectual property. And the more I thought about it, the more I, I came to the conclusion, which a lot of other people had. Also, which it's hard to, you know, 20 years ago before the Internet, it was hard to find this. Now you can find it all over the place. But in in retrospect, in recreating and seeing the strands of this thought, there's been a strong undercurrent of opposition to patent and copyright for for a long time, even for centuries in a way, depending upon um, the phase of history that you're in. Basically, what happened was a couple hundred years ago or even several hundred years ago. Depending on um, where you want to say this, really started. Governments and kings started using their power to 
suppress speech and ideas because it was threatening to them or to the predominant religion of the time, or they started granting monopolies to producers who were their cronies to, you know, let them be the only manufacturer of playing cards and the only guys that could export, you know, sheep uh, skins or whatever. Um, and th these are called patents. So the origins of copyright were in censorship, that is trying to stop the spread of ideas. So in other words, the official publishing company that's authorized by the crown would have the right to determine which books could be published. This is the origin of copyright, and it, you know, it was kind of formalized in the Statute of Anne in 1709. And the origin of patent was in the Statute of Monopolies in 1623, which again, was a way of formalizing this grant of monopoly privileges, which is really mercantilism and protectionism. So basically, all these laws arose from the government trying to control thought and trying to grant favors to people. has really nothing whatsoever to do with the free market. Well, as these things became institutionalized and bureaucratized, and then democracy came into play, and then the U.S. Constitution started trying to congeal and embody some of these ideas in 1789. It got put in the U.S. Constitution. It became part of the fabric of the Western legal tradition and spread across the world in the other Western democracies and the Western industrialized nations. So basically, the, what you have is the government telling or giving these monopoly rights to favored people, people that produce works of art or literature in the form of copyright or the people that come up with new ideas in technology, inventors, research and scientists, people like that. And they have the right to go to the government and to ask the courts of the government to you know, impose fines or penalties or even put people in jail who use their ideas without their permission. And this has become come to be called intellectual property and in my you know, my opinion, that is just a propaganda ploy. It was never originally called intellectual property. It was called patent and copyright or even monopoly. And the, the people that were in favor of it were in favor of it, but they were kind of cautious about it, like Thomas Jefferson. You know, they knew that it was dangerous to let the government uh, grant these monopoly privileges. So they thought they should be very restricted in their ability to do it. But as, you know, as, as it came under attack by economists and by people saying, wait a minute, this is not free market. This is not property rights. This violates you know, freedom of speech, et cetera. So the, the people that had entrenched interest in this started calling it, well, it's my property right. So they called it intellectual property. So now we've come to a point where everyone in the mainstream that's in favor of you know, the Western quote-unquote capitalist system thinks of – one aspect of property rights is being intellectual property. So if you attack it, they say, well, then you're against property rights. Mm -hmm. You know, so they don't, they don't, I don't, either they don't know what they're talking about or they do and they're being disingenuous and they don't really care about the truth. They're just trying to defend the status quo. And I've seen libertarians make that very argument too that uh, you're not in favor, you don't respect property rights if you're not in favor of IP. Right, and you could make the same argument for you know, welfare rights. I mean, you know, someone who's on Social <laughs> Security, you know, they, they think they paid into the system and they have a property right in getting paid this benefit until they die. And they, they think of it as a property right too, but that's because the government has entrenched this property right in the system. And of course, the culture, the culture and the scientific community you know, everything becomes distorted because of this, um, mm -hmm. you know, and people get used to business models that rely upon this. You know, they get used to charging a, a software royalty. They get used to getting royalties for their music. Um, Microsoft and Apple arise and they, they have certain business practices that would only be possible uh, with with a copyright or patent system in place. And everyone gets used to it. And when you suggest that we got to get rid of it, or change it, everyone freaks out. That kind of segs nicely into our next segment for us, is what sort of distortions in the movie industry and in the publishing industry are due to IP? Well, people that are interested, uh, we can't go into it in too much detail here, but um, if you go to my website, which is uh, c4sif.org, Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom.org, 
Um, I've got some blog posts collected there on a lot of these um, sort of examples and horror stories about what has happened. So one example was that actually the, the entire the entire fact that Hollywood arose as an industry and one of the you know one of the most influential cultural forces on the planet. It actually mm -hmm. started in you know the the movie industry was was started in New York and the Northeast Corridor. And there was these patent wars, okay? These patent threats got started with, I don't, I don't remember what it was, projectors or some kind of technology. So there's this entirely convoluted story about why the movie industry migrated west and ended up in Hollywood, partly to evade the mafia and, <laughs> and patent. Unbelievable. <laughs> so that's one, that's one thing. Um, now, by mafia, do you mean the government, or do you mean I mean the, actual... the real mafia? <laughs> the, I mean the real mafia, but they wouldn't have been able to do this without the no, no, it's the real mafia, and uh, plus the government and the patent industry. It's crazy. Um, I mean, look, l let me give another example. Uh, in the trademark area, trademark is another type of, of intellectual property. There is a case pending right now before the U.S. Supreme Court, which concerns the uh, first sale doctrine. That is a copyright doctrine um, that says that if you sell a book to someone, let's say a physical object like a book, of course in the old days all things were physical objects, then you can charge them a monopoly price because you have the copyright. In other, in other words, you can prevent competitors from selling a similar book, so that means you can charge a higher than market price for that book. But that's all you get is that one bite at the apple, they call it. You, you get to you know, get your monopoly price, the first sale, and that's it, which means that your customer now owns that book, and he can resell it to someone else, or he can loan it to other people um, without being in, tr in trouble with copyright law. He can't make a copy of the book because that would be a copyright issue, but he could resell his book at least. That's why there's a used book market like on Amazon right, or in used books. And that's why libraries can loan books because of the first sale doctrine. Well, some guy a couple of years ago in uh, I don't know, Thailand or Indonesia or somewhere, he moved to America. He was a grad student, and he realized there, that there was a huge price discrimination being charged um, by Wiley, one of these academic publishers. They were charging you know hundreds of bucks for a book for grad students in the U.S., but you know twenty bucks in Thailand. The paper might have been a little bit thinner. But it was the same book. So what he did was he got his relatives to buy the books at the price overseas, ship them to him in America, and he resold them to people in the U.S. He was in, he was you know engaging in arbitrage. He was making a killing, and he he was theoretically not violating copyright because the books were actually not pirated books; they were actually published, printed, and sold by Wiley, but in another country. Well, they didn't like that, of course, right? They want to engage in price discrimination and use the copyright monopoly to rape the consumer in the local country to the highest degree possible. And in the U.S., that's you know among the highest. So they sued him, and the court held that the, this first sale doctrine, because of the way the copyright statute is worded, does not apply if the first sale is outside of the country. <laughs> now, now, and, and, and the circuit courts in the U.S. have split on this, so we're waiting for the U.S. Supreme Court to decide. But if they hold that the, the court in this case was correct, what that theoretically means is that every library in the country, in, a, in the U.S., every book that they have on their shelves that was bought overseas ne can no longer be resold or even loaned without violating copyright law. And not only that, like if you have a watch or a piece of furniture or anything with an artistic design on it that's potentially copyrightable that was manufactured outside the country, if you own this piece of furniture or whatever, this painting, you can't resell it without violating copyright. You'd have to get the permission of the guy you bought it from, which you might not even know, right? So now we have an orphan works problem, which is a, which is a, a book problem usually, infecting the world of real goods. Um, and the reason I brought up the trademark issue, you talked about distortions. Um, another case that was similar was the Omega or Omega watch case where Omega uh, had Costco buying watches like let's say as a $10,000 watch, and, but it was being sold for like $4,000 in Costa Rica or something. 
So Costco sent buyers down to Costa Rica to buy the watch, and they're reselling it in Costco stores here for eight thousand or something like that. So they were selling it far less here than the, the retail price, but they were making a big arbitrage profit. So Omega didn't like that, so they came up with a copyrighted like world logo design, which they just kind of engraved on the back of the watch, a tiny little world logo. And now they could claim that there's a copyright being violated because the first sale doctrine doesn't apply to the sale outside the country, and they won that case. So you, all these issues are coming to a head. Now, that's an example of cultural distortion where you have trademark logos or copyrighted logos being put on the back of watches, which are physical functional items, solely to take advantage of an artificial IP law so that you can engage in protectionism. And another example of that is in the field of you know um, high-end fashion where you have like the Louis Vuitton logo is put all over the purse. Now, why do they do that? It's kind of weird, right? I mean, if I buy a, a Toyota car, I don't have the Toyota symbol all over the car. I mean, it might be on the front, yeah. but it's not all over. It's not part <laughs> of the car's appeal that it looks like a Toyota symbol. But these high-end fashion designers don't have copyright and, and patent protection so they can be knocked off. So what they do is they start embedding their designs in the products themselves to make it part of the culture so that they can use trademark law to stop people from knocking them off. Now, that's not a huge, horrible thing in society, but it is a distortion. I mean, I don't think we would have this entire field of goods being made like this if not for patent and IP and copyright law. People who support intellectual property will probably say that these are just abuses and that if we just reform the system to prevent these abuses, it'll work okay. So um, maybe you could briefly uh, explain you know, why that's not good enough and why intellectual property is, uh, as a whole is unjustified. I guess it depends upon your approach to it. It's, it's, it's almost like taxes. You could say that if you reform the tax system, it could be better, right? If you give the taxpayers a bill of rights… If you have to make the government bear the burden of proof that you evaded taxes, or if you lower the tax rates from 54% to 32%, that's an improvement. But what's the optimal rate of taxation? I mean, the libertarian would say 0%, right? Or at least if you're a minarchist, it would be some very small rate that's sufficient to fund a barely minimum government. So that'd be like 2% or 1% or half a percent or something like that. And analogously, in the field of IP, you can improve it by curbing abuses, you, but all that really means is you reduce the strength of IP rights, which is analogous to reducing the level of taxation. So if you make patent terms smaller or if you make the copyright uh, penalties for violating copyright less, in other words, you can't go to jail or you reduce statutory penalties from 7500 bucks per, per infringing act to… I don't two dollars or maybe no no statutory minimum, but you have to actually make the the, the the victim prove damages. That would reduce the harm caused by these laws. That's true. But it wouldn't stop the basic injustice, which is that the government is giving someone the right to tell other people what they can do with their own property. Basically, the the purpose of these laws is to slow down competition, to prevent uh, there being what they call you know dog eat dog competition. So the idea, the, the main argument for IP is that, well, if you don't have a monopoly over your idea, then if I go put an idea into the market, and if the main selling point of the idea is something that's you know in the way it looks or the way it the way it works, then someone else could just observe that and easily compete with me. And if they can easily compete with me, it's going to be more difficult for me to maintain a profit for a long enough time for me to recoup my cost of investing in this idea in the first place. Therefore, the government has to slow down competition and keep people from competing with me. But you see this idea is nothing different than the, the same idea of the infant industry argument or the idea that we need to have tariffs to protect you know, um, the, the industry in our country, you know, like the steel industry needs to be protected from competition from the Japanese, for example. Otherwise, they couldn't make a profit, and our steel industry is going to go out of business. So all this is just tinkering by people that are kind of central planners who want to say, we think we know what the American industry or the entertainment industry or the innovative or inventive industry look, needs to look like. 
And we don't think we're going to have enough of it unless we tamper with the market and stop people from competing with these guys. We need to give them a break from competition. So essentially, economically, it's nothing different than if the government were to have a completely free market and they were going to tax everyone and take that money and, re and give it as a, as a reward to the people the government thinks have promoted, you know, the, uh, come up with the most innovation. So basically, if the government were to do this honestly, they would just tax everyone, you know, take a thousand bucks from every family in the U.S., have a panel of experts, and at the end of the year, the government would say, okay, if you think you've come up with a great novel or a great poem or a great painting or a great movie or a new innovation for a smartphone or whatever, come present your claim to us, and if we think you're worthy, we'll give you a million dollars to reward you. That's exactly what the patent system does. It's just it's hidden, you know, just like the tax system is now where we have withholding, right? People don't really see or where we have sales tax and you don't really see the taxes that are being taken from you. Or we have tariffs where we don't really see the cost the government is imposing on everyone. So mm -hmm. the problem with the system is that it is anti-competitive. It undercuts property rights. It's protectionist. It slows down innovation on purpose. And it imposes costs on all of society without being transparent about it. My impression of intellectual property right now is that there's some type of tipping point that's been reached where a system that was always bad has just become absolutely absurd. Is that your impression of things in the last 20 years or so? Yeah. So for patents, I think that patents have always been bad, but they've just sort of been like a a drag on society or on the economy or on innovation. And they've also distorted things, right? Because the mm -hmm. patent system rewards some types of innovations, but not others. So for example, it rewards um, practical gizmos and creations, but it doesn't give a, a patent right for abstract ideas, basic science, basic research, mathematical theorems. So of course that tends to distort and lead to a skewing effect in the economy uh, where companies will throw more money behind the former and not the latter, because you can get a monopoly behind one and not the other. Just like the fashion industry tends to push, put their money behind designs that they can get a trademark behind, right? So, I mean, yeah. so you can see this the distorting effect. And I think it's accelerated in the, in the last 20 years, not because of the internet so much, but because of internationalization and just because of the pace of technological change. I think the internet's helped to expose it and to publicize it. So now we're all, I mean, every day or two, you can read them. I mean, just two or three days ago, there was this company called Mar Marvell, which makes some kind of chips. They were hit with a $1.2 billion patent jury verdict for infringing, I think it was Cornell or no, it was, uh, uh, it was Carnegie Tech's um, University, Carnegie Mellon University's patents. And the judge, the judge could still triple that with what's called trouble damages. So it could be a $3 billion um, verdict. Um, wow. Jeez. And it's not, it's not even over yet. I mean, if, if, they, if they win, then I mean, I mean, I mean, I don't know about much about Marvell, but I don't, I mean, they're not like on the level of Apple. So $3 billion is a lot of money to a lot of companies. Not a lot of companies make $3 billion of profit, right? Level. And of course, now you have the uh, situation where the big companies all have understandings with each other, yes. but none of the little companies can break in. And that's a natural flow in a free market is the little guy innovating and breaking into the scene. Yeah. So I think what's happened in the patent arena, that's the innovation technology arena, is that uh, the patent situation has, has definitely gotten worse because these rights have become – they become part of the economic currency of Western quote unquote capitalism because you know, you know that if you have this right to sue, you can sell it and trade it. And that's why these patent trolls have emerged. Tra patent trolls are no so called non practicing entities um, who can sue people. It, and they don't really make the products, they just go around collecting tolls. Uh, although, in my view, patent trolls are less harmful than actually practicing into these because the patent troll just wants a fee. He just wants you to pay a little charge and go about your business. But I guarantee you Apple, as you know, the quotes from Steve Jobs have made clear, he wanted to kill all his competitors who were who made anything similar to an iPhone or to an iPad. He wanted to, <laughs> he wants to get the government courts to issue an injunction saying 
Samsung, you cannot, or Google even, he's a little bit afraid to sue Google, I think, but you, you cannot make a competing device at all, or you've got to change it a lot and make, you know, gimp it up and gum it up. So that's bad enough, but I do, in the copyright front, I think you're right. I think in the copyright front, copyright was always in the background. I think what happened was copyright arose out of censorship, as I mentioned earlier. But one reason that it became a little bit more popular with the statute of, of Anne and similar laws in Europe in the, in the 1700s was because it gave the author the copyright instead of the printers and the publishers. So in a way, it liberated them from what had previously been the control of the censor. So before, before copyright became institutionalized, the government had the Stationers Guild and these other, these other institutions with which they could use to prevent publication of a book. After the Statute of Anne, the author held the copyright, which meant he could give permission for people to print it. So in a way, it was popular because it liberated them from outside censorship, but it became seen as the right of the author to stop people he didn't want to publish it from publishing it. It became seen as a way of making money, and it gradually morphed into that. But even so, it wasn't that harmful. It, it gummed up the works, kind of like the patent system did and still does today. Until I think um, the copyright term was extended and extended over and over again by corporate interests like like the Disney Corporation. You know, it used to be 14 years originally plus 14 years, one more extra term you could extend it to, and you had to apply for it, and you had to pay a registration fee. Now it's automatic; you can't get rid of it, and the term is like 70 years after you're dead. So we're talking 100, you know, say 150 year terms for copyrights now. Um, and with the explosion of the internet 15 or so years ago, it's of course gone crazy uh, in terms of the amount of copyright infringement has exploded because the internet is a copying machine. That's what it is, right? And so the amount of infringement has gone crazy. The penalties have gone up, and the government is now using it. The state is using it as an excuse to regulate the internet. So basically you have the state using pornography, like child pornography, terrorism, online gambling, and pirating, copyright piracy, as an excuse to regulate the internet because they hate the internet. Right, so the state is using copyright as an excuse, which they tried to do last year with SOPA and PIPA, the Stop Online Piracy Act, and they protect. I forgot what PIPA stands for. Um, they failed, but they're implementing these things piecemeal, one by one. So I do think it's much, much worse. I think copyright is much worse of a um, threat to liberty than patent is. Patent is a huge cost on society. But it slows things down and just imposes a, a kind of like a tax. But I think copyright is an extremely severe danger. But luckily, I think that the advent of torrenting and encryption has allowed you know people to find a way to get around it. So there's a silver lining there. And that kind of brings me to the next point I wanted to touch on. What do you see happening in the future? You've got the forces of Mordor at the top who are trying to impose uh, their intellectual property laws, but then at the grassroots level, you have all these new technologies for circumventing things. What's going to come out of all of this? I mean, it's hard to predict. I think it's a little bit like the drug war, where, the, I mean, the drug war has been an obvious, quote, failure, if you want to look <laughs> at it like that, for three, four, five decades. But it, the, the government still keeps ratcheting it up, saying that it's like the war on terror, right? It's a failure, but they just want, they use that to, to demand more resources. So it's a little bit like that. You know, unlike the drug war, though, I think most people have an in, intuitive sense that there's just something wrong with putting people in jail for smoking marijuana, which is why we see the the breaking of the dam a little. I mean, I think that you know medical marijuana laws are in twenty something states now, and I think that med marijuana decriminalization is going to spread too. But the problem with IP is it's seen as a type of property right, so there could be some inertia there. On the other hand, the young people and people that are good with the internet, everyone's a pirate, and everyone knows this, right? <laughs> so I think that there is going to be a big growing battle between the media companies, Hollywood, the software industry, and the big entrenched kind of oligopolistic technology companies in the West like Apple, Microsoft, these kinds of companies. And they're, they have the influence over Congress, right? And then the U.S. is still the big player on the block, and the U.S. is trying to 
twist the arms of all these other countries like China and Russia, et cetera, Canada, Mexico, India, to adopt our kinds of IP laws. And they make some, they make some progress, but it's kind of halting. My hope is, and I've, I think there's some reason to think this, is that gradually over time, people are just going to see that copyright is just sort of like prohibition. At a certain point in time, everyone's going to realize this is nonsense. It's crazy. But what I'm really afraid of is that until we break this utilitarian mindset that everyone has and everyone's brainwashed with, that the purpose of law and the purpose of government-created law is that we need to come in and tinker with things to try to make sure there's enough innovation and enough creativity and have a balance. As long as we have that mentality, it's going to be hard to eradicate it altogether. But my hope is that as a practical matter, copyright is going to basically become a non-issue. It's going to be, become something that's going to be applied only to commercial interests and people that are visible, which means more and more people will become invisible. They'll use the internet, the dark net, you know, encryption, torrenting, etc. Uh, and they're doing it already. So I think that's one really good thing. So I just hope that over time people start looking at IP as a joke, and they start realizing that it's, it's nothing that's not really part of property rights, not part of liberty, not part of justice, and that it becomes uh, illegitimate in people's eyes. Let's hope. I think something that many aspiring authors or established authors and even readers who listen to our podcast might be concerned about would be how are creators, artists, what's their incentive to uh, write a book or produce a movie if uh, there's no intellectual property laws to uh, protect their work and, and make sure they get paid for it? How are people going to make money or should they be expected to make money doing these creative endeavors in the absence of either enforceable property <laughs> right or if they're in a society that recognizes that copyright and patent are illegitimate? Yeah, and I actually understand that, and I think people get used to a certain you know, society, and, and when you talk about changing things radically, they get nervous. And also, they, you know, they, they're somewhat subject to the propaganda spread by the pro-IP interests where they demonize people like us as being anti-mind, anti-creativity, anti-artist, whatever. I mean I'll hear this all the time from these inventors. They'll say, well, you're against the little guy. This is, uh, you're just going to help the big companies. Of course, they don't even understand that patents – help big companies to arise because you had Apple and Samsung and Google and Motorola. These guys can counter sue each other, come to a, you know, a settlement, pay each other royalties and go about their business because they have patents to rattle against each other. Um, but f I think for the artist, I think, first of all, I think they should realize that the patent system and the copyright system don't guarantee anyone any money in the first place. It's always been the case, as I understand it, and throughout history and even now, that most small, unknown artists don't make much money at all. It's always been a side, a, a, either a passion or a hobby. And the publishing companies and the intermediaries or the middlemen are the ones that, that have the power, and they have the power partly because of the copyright system in the first place. In fact, you can see that there's this, this interesting phenomenon in the last two or three years of hundreds of, of novelists making a living. Off of just selling Amazon ebooks for uh, on Kindle, you know, for like a dollar ninety nine or ninety nine cents or three ninety nine a book, without even having a publisher. So they sell it for a lower price. They get an audience, etc. Um, second of all, I think we have to realize that the copyright system comes from having a government in the first place. And the biggest threat to prosperity, of course, is the state. If the state were to get out of our way and quit taxing us and imposing regulations, everyone will be richer right off the bat just by the government getting out of the way. So if you get rid of the government, which is the cause of the problem, and they, they wouldn't be able to impose copyright law, they also wouldn't be able to tax. So that's another thing. Um, and finally, I would say that most artists now either don't make much money or to the extent they make money, they could easily make as much in a free market. So I was talking with someone about the Harry Potter phenomenon. And just brainstorming. Now, the danger is when you give one of these examples, which I'll, I'll give you my ideas on this in a second, but you give an example to one of these people, a the utilitarian-minded person. They, they say, well, how am I going to make money in a free market? And you give them an example. You say, well, maybe you could do it this way. And then they'll say, okay, well, maybe that'll work for me, but what about for poets? So they, they, those, they, they always come up with another question. <laughs> They're never going to end with their questions. But they ask a question about novelists, for example. Or, and so I say, well… You know, J.K. Rowling didn't write Harry Potter. She wrote it as a welfare mother in, in London or something. So she would have, she, she still would have written it. 
And in the world of where there's a lot of piracy like we have now, maybe she would have self-published on Kindle. Maybe she would have made $30,000. I don't know. But she would have become very popular because the books were popular, and piracy would have made her even more popular. Well, now she's got a million, two million, ten million, thirty million kids out there in the world who love her stuff. So now she's writing number two. So she thinks to herself, well, I'm going to put a little note up on my website saying I've got number two written. As soon as I get five million subscriptions for five bucks each, I'm going to release it. Well, I guarantee she would have gotten that. That's 25 million bucks. Now, I don't know about you guys, but that's a lot of money, you know? I mean, yeah. and, and, and then she could have done that repeated times with the, the other five books. So she easily could have been worth $100, $200 million just from novels alone, even in a world of piracy. And then she could have, you know, by the time the third or fourth book came out, then the movie industry would be getting interested and they'd be saying, hmm, let's make a movie of Harry Potter number one. But there's no copyright law, so there's no barrier to do it. You don't need her permission. So there may, maybe there would be two or three Harry Potter movies from different competing studios on the drawing boards. Well, one of them might go to, to J.K. Rowling and say, listen, if you will agree to be a consultant and to, you know, to say that you're in favor of this movie and that ours is the official authorized version, we think we could sell more tickets to your fans because they're going to – if there's three movies out of Harry Potter number one, most people can't afford to go see the movie three times. They're going to pick the one that you authorized and endorsed and you cooperated on because they're going to think that's the official version. We'll give you you know, 5% of the movie receipts or whatever. This is just what I came up with sitting down as a patent lawyer thinking about this kind of stuff. And I guarantee you that authors and novelists and creators and artists are going to think of all kinds of a myriad of ways that they can use their celebrity, their fame, their reputation to make millions of dollars in a copyright-free world. And, you know, of course, we have Kickstarter. We have other platforms like that that would arise and that have arisen already that, uh, that are just multiplying the ways that you can profit in a copyright free world. We have Flatter, F L A T T R, which is a way that your fans can give you a little donation if they really like your work, et cetera. It sounds to me like in the hypothetical scenario you gave about getting the movie made of your book, that Rowling would probably have more influence over how the movie is made without copyright than she does with it because with copyright she just sells the rights to the you know movie producers and then that's it she's got out of the picture yes uh and and so they do whatever they want but if in this in your scenario they have to curry her favor in order to get her endorsement and so that she might have more influence over how it's made that way yeah i think it's possible i mean i think in her case she was such a popular success um by the time she made the deal, she probably had an inordinate amount of influence over the movies but um mm -hmm. as a general matter i think you're right I mean, not only that, I mean, listen, she's not going to go out and spread love about her the, – the movie made about her book unless she really believes in it. So they're going to really want to please this author because they really want her to believe in it and to promote the work uh, and to participate in you know, number two and number three and number four down the road. Yeah, I agree completely. Um, mm -hmm. I think uh, without copyright, you have the same kind of distribution that you do under copyright with, with traditional publishers uh, in terms of who succeeds and who doesn't as an author. You'll have a few people who somehow become viral, and break out, and make crap loads of money, and you'll have people who get by with a few hundred sales a month, or some people with even less. And that's the same thing that happens now with the traditional publishers. You have a few, you know, breakout stars who basically support everybody else that the company publishes, and most people don't even make enough to live on. Yeah, I think with technology, you know, that model may be changing a lot because the the mm -hmm. cost is going down and. Uh, mm -hmm. My friend Jeff Tucker and I uh, talk about this a lot, uh, and one thing you, you, you mentioned uh, brings this out is that people talk about the first mover advantage, right? And, and, and sometimes the IP proponents dismiss that. You say, well, you, know, you can just instantly go compete with someone. Well, you, I don't know how many books were published this year. Probably 10 million or 50 million books were published in, 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 uh, in the world this year. I mean it's tens of millions of books are published every year, and I'm just talking about books. I'm not talking about paintings or – posters or magazines or movies or whatever just just say books alone or tv shows whatever so you've had m tens of millions of books published and like you say some of them are hits and some are not well if you're a pirate you can't just go copy everything that comes out i mean what good would that do i mean t are you going to go in the business of hosting a server like the internet archive and do the world a service and copy the entire world's output of literary production every second. 
No, you're going to be selective, and what you're going to do is you're going to sit back and you're going to wait, and you're going to see which books are the breakout books, which are the popular ones, which means you have to wait and see. In other words, you have to wait and see which ones become popular. So we realized that, okay, finally Harry Potter's popular, and, and now I know that the uh, – uh, what are the vampire movies that are out? The Twilight books, they're the Stephanie Meyer books. They've become the hit, but not these other books, right? So when you finally realize one book series has become popular, then you go pirate it. But by the time you do that, it's already become popular, and the author's already sold millions of copies. In other words, you wouldn't have known to copy it unless they've already sold millions of copies. So the first mover advantage is almost like an a priori thing. It has to be there because you don't know who to copy unless you wait and see you know, what's popular. So that, what, mm -hmm. what that means is you can, the author can always – sell a lot of copies of a popular work before people get wind of the fact that it's going to be worth copying in the first place. And that's not to mention just the loyalty that fans will have. I mean, I heard Tolkien, uh, someone was selling his books in the U.S. without uh, giving any of the proceeds to him, and he addressed his fans and asked them to stop buying those copies, and they did, yeah. and they went out of business. Yeah, no, I, I, th I think there's something to that. And that also, that also goes to what's unnatural about the current copyright system where it lasts for, let's say, 70 years after you're dead. I mean, I don't know if people would feel the same loyalty towards, I don't know, Christopher Tolkien or maybe his grandson or whoever's alive now who's the owner of this, or maybe, uh, maybe it's uh, Warner Brothers. I don't know who, know who owns it now. But, yeah, I don't know. You know, but during Tolkien's life, I think people would have some kind of loyalty mm -hmm. to the guy, which means the natural kind of life of this loyalty thing is during their lives, which sort of makes sense, right? Because he's the creator. He's the one who should reap the reward for it. Yeah, and, and the heirs of talented creators will have to work for a living actually <laughs> instead of instead of living off of their their parents uh you know work yeah or or they could do <laughs> what horrible. or they could do what what uh what Brian Herbert did and he could maybe mm -hmm. take his dad's notes and fashion them into prequels and you know all he's done he did something valuable for the fans and maybe they would reward mm -hmm. him for keeping his dad's memory alive and for doing the work to um uh, give them something they enjoy reading yeah, he's not just living off of royalties. He's actually producing something yeah, new. Yeah, he is. Yeah, to, to actually earn the money he gets. Uh, I think we're coming up on an hour, and we promised you half an hour uh, interview. <laughs> so I think it's probably about time to wrap it up. Could you um, tell uh, our listeners uh, you know, where they can find more about you and intellectual property and your arguments against intellectual property on the web, uh, like your website and Twitter handle, that sort of thing? Yeah, it's everything's linked at c 4 siforg or my personal website, stephankinsella.com. And my Twitter handle is N.S. Kinsella. N is for Norman, my first name. So it's N.S. Kinsella. And they can find you on Facebook and Google Plus uh, under the same. Yeah, Facebook, same Facebook, names, Facebook right? is also Facebook slash, I think, N.S. Kinsella. And um, also Facebook slash C4 SIF. We'll be sure to put some links in the show notes. Yeah, thanks for joining us today uh, and giving us an hour of your time. Yeah, we appreciate yeah. the time. I enjoyed it. Uh, good luck with your podcast. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, guys. Okay, that's it for our first episode. We hope you enjoyed the show. You can find out more about our podcast at prometheus-unbound.org slash podcast. And you can find the show notes for this episode at prometheus-unbound.org slash PUP001. If you haven't already, you can subscribe to our podcast-only RSS feed at prometheus-unbound.org slash podcast feed. On our website, you can also find links to our Google+, Twitter, and Facebook pages, and sign up to receive email updates in your inbox. You can find out more about me at gaploche.com and as G.A. Ploche on most of the major social networks like Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. That's G-A-P-L-A-U-C-H-E. I'm also on Google+, where I'm the most active, so please look for me there. Matthew's website is in development right now, but we'll be sure to let you know what the URL is when it's ready. You can find Matthew on Twitter at WitherWe, that's W-I-T-H-U-R-W-E, and at Facebook.com slash GoCrew, GoCrew. We'd love to hear from you, so please do send us feedback. You can send us voicemail at 225-257-9596 or by using the Google Voice widget on our website. Or you can send us email at feedback at prometheus-unbound.org. 
Be sure to stay tuned as we have more great content for you coming up in future episodes. Next up is our first discussion episode in which we'll be talking about libertarian speculative fiction, as well as introducing our Today's Tomorrow's Writing Prompt and Fiction Forecast segments. And after that, we have an interview with Jeffrey Tucker, the editor of Laissez Faire Books. If you have any questions for us about libertarian speculative fiction or for Jeffrey Tucker, please send them in soon. And finally, while you're waiting for the next episode to drop, don't forget to check out the website for the latest news and reviews. 